Hello and welcome back to the Red and White Podcast. Uh, today, joining me to preview uh, the game against Northampton, we have from Northampton, uh, James, who is the Northampton Town Match Day reporter for the Chronicle and the Echo. Uh, James, thanks for coming on. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Uh, and a man who won't need much introduction, I would imagine, for most Sunderland fans watching, uh, BBC New Castle uh, reporter for Sunderland uh, for many years, uh, Nick Barnes. Nick, uh, how are you? And uh, thanks good, for coming no on. Good, no problem at all. Good, no problem. Yeah, um, we'll jump straight into it. Uh, obviously, we haven't played in a little while. Uh, Northampton, however, had a game over the, the Christmas period, I believe the 29th, I think it was. Uh, a 3-1 win against Gillingham. Was that a good result, James? Yes, uh, very good result. Much needed result as well. It was uh, Things were heading heading quite quite bad um, before Christmas. Four defeats in a row, lost two of those games 4-0. Manager under pressure, players out injured. So it was all going wrong and, and you sort of feared the worst. So so that was, uh, you know, especially with a big game coming up against Sunderland, they needed to, to win that game and they played well and, and, and they were... Good value for it as well. So what went right in that game that hadn't been going right previously? Uh, it's a good question. One of the big differences was uh, they had Alan Sheehan back. Uh, he missed. He signed a short-term deal in October. Um, experienced centre-back. I think he's been with Luton and numerous other clubs. Um, and as soon as he came in in October, he made a massive difference to the defence. Just just has that sort of calm head. Um, because they were leaking goals for fun before he came in. Um and yeah, first sort of three, four, five games he came in, they were a lot more solid. Just looked as a whole team, they looked a lot tougher to beat, a lot tougher to break down. And it wasn't just him, but he was a, clearly a, a big influence. And then he missed four games with injury, and those were the four games they lost. And it, it's not really any coincidence, you know. He came back on Tuesday, and suddenly they look a much better team, much stronger team. Um, and also, I think uh, they, they played uh, two different strikes together. I mean, Keith Kerr, the manager, has struggled to to find a settled strike partnership, but they played together, Danny Rose and Benny Ashley still on um, Tuesday night and, and they were really good together. They worked hard. They they ran Gillingham ragged a little bit at the back, you know, full of energy, full of running, good movement. Um, and that, that really gave them something to, to hit up front, which is something they've lacked a lot this season. So that, that made a big difference as well. And it was just, a, a, I think the 10 day break, because they didn't play on Boxing Day due to, due to COVID reasons, obviously. Um, I think that helped a lot as well. It just helped them reset and, you know, just sort of take a break, take take them out of the firing line and and sort of go again, really. And, and that's exactly what they did. They just looked fresh and, and, and full of energy and confidence on Tuesday. And, yeah, it was a much improved performance. So you have picked up form just as you're about to play us. Um, really, <laughs> uh, obviously, with you, you mentioned that it was the, the game was called off. It was for the other team, wasn't it? Was it was Akwit, I think, you was meant to play on Boxing Day. And they, they had it switch, it was. <laughs> Switch, yeah, and, and they had uh, Corbin in the squad. I mean, obviously, we've had 13 players end up testing positive, three of which the goalkeepers. Um, and I was going to ask you, I mean, I know, I think the last of the mm. players came in yesterday, I believe. Um, but is, is it at all a concern to you that although they might not have Corbin and theoretically be ready to play, that might not be fit? Because not only have they not had any matches in, in however long a training, in however long, but, mm. um, it, you know, if you, if you think if you've, had, if you've ever had a flu, you you couldn't then do like rigorous exercise the day after. Um, I'm quite concerned. If you want to start tomorrow, the, the players might go onto the pitch and, and just not not have 100 percent fitness yeah. at all. Uh, yeah, I, 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 sorry, James. I think it's um, an issue that's going to affect a lot of clubs. I think I, you know one of the ongoing things now is is a the the long term effects of those clubs that have had a number of players with the virus, but also having to concertina all the you know the reschedule fixtures in to the remaining months of the season. I think, you know, I'm not so sure that the, the coronavirus issue is going to escalate now with the clubs because that many clubs have had it to quite a big degree that it's almost as though they've sort of purged themselves of it. But, you know, the, the after effects of that is A, as you say, the, the medical side effects and then B, trying to reschedule those games. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the, the medical one for me where, I mean, if you've just had COVID and you've only only just been able to go to stop self-isolating a couple of days ago, are you really going to be ready to, to play 90 minutes against a team that's fully fit and actually relatively well rested, having, not having had a, a game on Boxing Day? But then, of course, you look at rescheduling the fixtures. I've seen a tweet uh, earlier uh, the other day that said, I think Sunderland now, before the end of the season, if we were to play all the games right up until the last day of the season, would have a game every four hours, four days and six hours. I mean, we're essentially going to be playing Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, right up until the, the very end of the season with maybe one or two breaks here and there, which... It's it's just it's just not not sustainable sort of thing. I think I think that's going to be the case. Well, it, it will be the case. There's no doubt they're going to be playing two games a week now 
to the end of the season. Plus, on, on top of that, you've got the, the, the Football League trophy to the Papa John's trophy to squeeze in as well if they progress in that. Um, I, I, you know, I had a conversation yesterday about Lee Johnson and honeymoon periods and coming in and taking over the club. And I think, you know, the, the general consensus of the people are speaking to was that I think a number of people now are starting to write this season off and say that Lee Johnson's basically got to look to next season um, when we're well out of the mire of coronavirus, when he's been able to bring his own players in um, and, and start again, because at the minute he's come in and all he's had to deal with is, is basically fighting fires. And I think, you know, to mount a serious promotion, you know, campaign now on the back of being 10 points adrift of the leaders. And even if you win your, your two games in hand, still being four points adrift of Lincoln um, it's, with, with the, the schedule that they're going to have and all those other issues that you've just been talking about, it, 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 you know, that's asking a lot at the best of times, let alone now when you're, you're facing all these sort of mounting problems. So, um, you know, I, it, it's going to be a case, I think, for a number of clubs of just limping through now, getting to the end of the season and taking stock. Yeah, I think I'm not a fan of, of, the, of the phrase of right off the season because as much as I've done it in place, um, I wouldn't say a responsibility, but the blame on Lee Johnson if he weren't to go up this season because regardless of how, how well of a job he does, it, well, first and foremost, it's not actually in his hands. You know, if, if the teams above us were to win all their games until, until the end of the season or, or there or thereabouts, you know, we, we mathematically couldn't catch them. Um, but also that, you know, with, with the, the, the COVID and the amount of games we've got and, and how far we are adrift anyway, um, as much as you, you, I don't, I don't think he's got to take the blame for this season if things didn't go to plan. I'm, I'm not a fan of, of, of the phrase. A few people have used it to say right off the season. But like, I don't know. I feel as if there's an attitude among Sun fans. So the end of the season and start again. But to me, like give it absolutely everything, and then at the very least, you're going to be in a better position to build if if you if you've gave 100. Um, percent just to, to move on slightly. Um, James, obviously we spoke about uh, your last game. You've had a, a few uh, not so great results recently, but 19th in the league so far. Um, is that a, a decent start uh, for uh, you? It, it depends who you ask. Um, yeah. Some some fans would say yes. Other fans might say you know you want to be aiming higher than that. They obviously, won promotion last season, but I think I think although when you win promotion, you have that you know that that spirit to high and you have that confidence. You go into the new season bouncing. You kind of, you know, a few weeks into the season, you're playing clubs like Portsmouth, Charlton, Hull. It kind of dawns on you that this is a tough division for a team like Northampton. This is, you know, this is going to be a tough season. And I think a lot of fans have now accepted that, especially with COVID and the, the, you know, the financial impact of that and just everything that's going on in the world. I think it's most fans have now realised that survival this season would would constitute a good season. Um, Although that might not be aiming too you know very high it might not sound that ambitious I think just given everything that's happened and you know they lost a lot of players in the summer they won their promotion and they lost their four best players the four most influential players and rebuilding the squad in the middle of a pandemic is not really the position you want to be in especially going up to a division going up a division so you know the manager was put in a difficult situation but they're, they're they're doing well, you know, the 19th are outside the bottom four and if they stay there come the end of the season, then it will count as a good season. And I think in this season of all seasons, that is that has got to be the main aim. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I always like to have, have a bit look at, at the League One club, like uh, we're playing uh, before play them. And I, I must say, when I saw you as a 19th in the league, I was thinking a club like Northampton, with all due respect, um, would probably be... I would say quite pleased with with just to, to stay up, given you know being in, in League Two like last season, and I, I don't think being in, in, in League One um, uh, much really. Uh, and as I see, after having to rebuild a squad over the summit in the middle of a pandemic, just you know to to, to stay afloat and, and stay in a in a division for another season is is, is probably uh, yeah absolutely. A good, a good absolutely. Aim, I think I think fans always want more, don't they? And that's understandable. They always want to 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 dream of being high of, of, of you know of, I know some fans who who think they should be competing at the top end of this division, which I think is a little ambitious. But, uh, you know, I, I like that ambition. I, I like that. And I think in the long term that they can do that. They, they, well, they at least can be an established League One club. Um, you know, they have the potential to be. It's just at the moment where they are at the moment and their finance, financial situation after the pandemic. You know, obviously no fans being allowed in again after the recent restrictions will have another impact on, on their their income. You've you got to look at it realistically. realistically and... and you look at recent history, you know, the last 20 years, very few have been spent in the top half of League One, that they are a sort of bottom half League One, top half League Two club. That's just 
where they are historically. Um, so if they can stay up this season, that like you say, that would be that would be seen as a, as a good achievement by the manager and the players. And then they would hope, you know, hopefully we get back to normal in the summer, and perhaps then they can kick on and 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 not just be a survival club in League One, and perhaps be a little bit more than that. But that's obviously a long way off at the moment. So we'll, yeah. we'll see how that goes. But yeah, it's all about survival. Um, did you have have fans in um for for the last game? Because you were into your two issue, weren't you? Yes, yeah, so we they, they didn't have fans in for the Gillingham game on Tuesday, um, but they did for. Uh, they had a thousand in for Doncaster before Christmas, and then two thousand in for Lincoln. Um, lost two 0 and four 0 so, so it didn't go very well. Um, but it was it was nice to have fans back. It, you know, it made such a difference. Even just uh, even just a thousand for the Doncaster game, you know, it makes such a difference. It was so lovely. Um, but obviously, it's all changing again now. So back to empty yeah. stadiums. I was just going to ask you what what's the experience like? Because I just think it's a good opportunity to, to, to someone who will have been there to ask. I mean. We've we've never had a never even looked close to, to getting fans in mm. ourselves. Um, but you know how does it um, like is is it is, is it really strict? Are the um, and, and uh, you touch on it there saying that it does make a big impact. But um, you know with a lot of the rules, obviously, yeah, it, it might just kill strict. the atmosphere. Really, it is, and it is different. Um, it's not it's not your usual what you usually get your usual atmosphere when you know packed stadium and no masks and social distance and all that. It is it is quite different, but. It's just just the small things like teams coming out for the warm up, teams going back in for the warm up, teams coming out the tunnel to kick off and, and you know the roar, the, the the clapping. It it just it's just so nice to hear that after so long out. And the, the experience is very different. You know you've got temperature checks when you go in. You've got um, arrows all all over the stadium to point where where to go, where to sit. Um, obviously a lot of um, hand washing to, to wash your hands. Um, and everyone wearing masks, very strange sight, just looking around the stadium and seeing fans wearing masks and sitting two metres away from each other. Um, but it was it was nice to, nice to have it. And although it's not the same as, as a packed stadium, I think it helps in Northampton because obviously it's a smaller, smaller stadium. And, you know, their typical attendance would be five, five and a half thousand. So, two thousand. Well, it's not too far from a typical match, do then, like, really? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So... Yeah, it, like at half capacity. Mm. Uh, there, there, anyway, um, I was just going to ask you uh, again, James. I mean, you said that the manager had struggled to kind of find his feet with uh, um, uh, the formation and, and tactics. But what, what, what kind of, um, what kind of system uh, can we expect you to play? Do you think? Uh, uh, he, he's tended to throughout his time at the club, he's been there just over two years, and the vast majority of games he has played three-five-two or, or sort of a variation of that, three-four-three. Three. Uh, but three at the back tends to be his his main. Formation. Although recently he's changed to four at the back. Um, I think about a month ago he changed to four at the back. Um, uh, however, on Tuesday against Gillingham, we went back to three at the back. So I think he'll stick with that. I think it'll be three five two, um, sort of two two high wing backs, um, so almost wingers at wing backs, um, looking to, to to create chances through those. And set pieces are always a big thing for them. They always um, work hard on set pieces. Um, and and the, like I said, the front two on Tuesday, you know, they, they were a breath of fresh air in a way, the way they played. Um, so <clears throat> I suspect those two will start again on, on Saturday. Um, so yeah, I, I, I imagine it will be three five two again, um, very similar team that played on Tuesday. Yeah, um, you mentioned there there was a, a centre back that um, came back from injury who you signed in, in October, and I think you said there was a lot of front. But in terms of key players, who is it that way that way you need to keep an eye on? So I'd say um, it depends who he plays because he might obviously with the, so many games at the moment he might rotate. But if Nicky Adams plays, he's always got a good set set piece delivery, good crosser. He puts balls into the box. You're right back. Um, he's always a uh, he's a winger, but he's been playing at wing back. So he'd probably be if he does play, it'll be left wing back. Um, if it isn't him, it might be Mark Marshall or Ricky Holmes. Who again, similar kind of players who. Like to get the ball in the box, a bit of trickery, you know, get out wide, get the ball in. Um, you've also got uh, Sam Hoskins. He's he's, a, he's almost never present. I think he's only missed one game this season. Um, he, he's quite he, he ten, he's very versatile. He's played in pretty much every position this season, but he tends to be sort of a, a central attacking midfielder, um, sort of bursting into the box from deep. Um, and then you've got the front two, Benny Ashley Seal and Danny Rose, who, who both. Were very instrumental in the win on Tuesday. Um, Danny Rose scored. I think he's. I think he's joint top scorer. Scorer, but he's only, I think he's only got four goals this season. It goes to show that their struggles in front of goal. Um, 
So yeah, and, and I think the other player would be Ryan Watson, who again he he sort of a central midfielder who likes to make runs into the box. Um, he, he he hasn't scored as many goals as he probably should have done, but he does just get on the end of a lot of crosses and a lot of chances. Um, so if he plays, I, I suspect he'll uh, he'll be a threat. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of areas we're going to look to exploit as well, a fairly similar question. And anywhere that you tend to have common problems, I think you said concede a lot of goals. Yeah, I think. When I last looked at the table, I think they had the worst defensive record, or, or at least one of the two or three worst defensive records. And they have they struggle when they go behind early. Um, I think, from memory, they've only not lost one game when they've got they've conceded the first goal. So if they concede the first goal, they tend to lose more often, or pretty much nine times out of ten, they'll lose that game. Um, so, you know, a good example is a recent game when Lincoln they played Lincoln at home, conceded after two minutes, and just never looked like getting back into it, and lost the game four 0 that 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 will be something Keith Kerr will, will will try to avoid. Is he might try to keep it tight for the first 20, 30 minutes to avoid going behind and maybe look to frustrate Sunderland. Um, but yeah, defensively they can struggle. They have had their difficulties um, down down the flanks because they play this wing back system. There tends to be space out wide. Um, but it, it, it depends how he goes. I mean, he, he had, in some of the big games this season against the bigger clubs, he has been quite defensive and and sort of. They, I think they have the second lowest possession count in the whole division. So it shows that they're quite happy to sort of not have the ball and, and let the other team dominate. Um, so he might go that way and, and, and sort of look to sit deep and, and play on the counter and, and look at set pieces. Um, but yeah, that, that first goal would be absolutely crucial, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. Um, I find it interesting to just look at, at the other teams and, and, and see where it is that we can exploit. I know you've got to be away, Jim's, uh, which is why we've asked you a, a bit more about Northampton up to this point. Uh, we'll let you go in a second, but just before you go, a uh, prediction for the game? Uh, I try to be optimistic whenever I can, but I, I'm struggling this weekend. They, they don't they don't have a good record against the uh, the better teams in the division, the stronger teams in the division. I think they've only won one game against a top half team or something like that. So I think it's going to be a struggle. Obviously, you know, you guys have a lot of talent and a, a lot of ability. And I think, I think I'm going to go with a, a narrow Sunderland win. I, I think I'll say 2-1 Sunderland. Two on Sunday. Well, uh, thanks for coming on, James. I know you've got to be away, so I'll, uh, I'll let you go. No worries. Thank you. Cheers, James. Yeah, um, Cheers, thanks. Nick, you've uh, waited very patiently there. Uh, obviously, we've had to do it slightly different um, today. Um, I mean, obviously, we're, we're talking about how uh, there's going to be concerns with the squad about COVID, but some of the players who play, have been playing, well, played in the last game and played a bit recently quite impressed me. A few of the young players in particular. Um, I know Dan Nails came in a few times, a player who I've who I've seen a rate when he's fit. Elliot Embleton seems to offer us something. Jack Diamond's impressed just about everyone. Um, Oliver Younger for me when he played against Fleetwood in, in the cup was um, really solid. I know he came off with an injury, and um, then of course there's Mitch Curry who has done really well in the 23s and obviously got a run out against Wimbledon. Um, would you look to to, to bring the, the the young players in it if the players are struggling with with fitness, especially if they haven't if they haven't been haven't uh, had? Court? Well, Lee Johnson might find his hands forced. I mean, if he if he if he you know, has the sort of key players in the squad are struggling. Um, I think he's he's shown already, I mean, like the Wimbledon game, although, you you know, there's a caveat to that, that he didn't want to play the game and, and his hand was forced to a degree in terms of who he could play. But, you know, he wasn't, you know, scared to play Jack Diamond at Lincoln, which I thought was a, you know, a huge call to go to Lincoln and put Diamond in from the start and, and it paid off for him. I think, you know, Diamond offers them something that they've been lacking uh, this season, it's a it's a it's a player with paces prepared to take players on. You know, he's, he's he's brave. He likes to get in the box, and and that is generally something that you know alarms defenders. So I think that that's been one of the big positives. And um, whether Lee Johnson goes down the road of introducing sort of Dan Neal, I mean, bear in mind he's still only eighteen, and Mitch Curry, I don't think we've seen enough of him yet to, to you know in first team level to sort of make a a, a judge of judgment about you know how much he'll be used but I think you know Lee Johnson is prepared to bring them into the squad and that's a positive and I think you know with the way the season's going to pan out we said before you know it's going to be a lot of games there's going to be a lot of pressure on players and I think you know we are going to see those players involved and uh, Kim Pioca will be on the way back as well so that's another bonus and hopefully they're coming over getting over the um, the injuries to the so sort the of key players, the Onions, the Gucci's and, and so on, if they can get them back in and keep them fit, because Lee Johnson did pick up on the fact he was slightly concerned about the type of injuries that the players were picking up earlier in the season and trying to eradicate that so we don't get into that situation where a player picks up a hamstring injury is out for four weeks. 
um, because that's going to be critical as well, trying to keep the players fit. But um, again, you know, it's going to be a big ask. It's going to, you know, be a, a tall order for the for Lee Johnson to to basically, uh, you know, hit the ground running if you like, because of that. That's almost what it feels like now, because he's he's come in and had this sort of faltering start because of the the break because of COVID, and it's almost like he's starting again this weekend at Northampton, and we don't know yet what the knock on is going to be in the next couple of weeks because the the talk is the pandemic is going to sort of hit its peak in in a fortnight's time so you know there's a lot of um unanswered questions if you like a lot of imponderables but um at least they're getting back to playing football at the weekend and i think that's the that's the one big positive now yeah definitely i think you raised a fair point with with, with the young players um obviously dan neil b and you know at, at, at the the young age that, that he is i I think a lot of fans are just calling to, to give them, you know, a shot and then at least we, we can see. But I think you're right with Rich Curry as well. I mean, he must have only played about 10 minutes against Wimbledon. But, uh, I mean, one thing I always say is that if, one thing I've been saying is that if Wyke isn't fit, he might genuinely be the best option we've got there if we're looking for a goal. Because I, I don't have much confidence in in the other two to, to actually um, provide us uh, with a goal. Uh, one thing I was going to ask as well, like, do you think that this, um, well, what this could potentially be in some way a blessing in disguise, or, or rather, maybe there's a silver lining in, in that you know, the Gooches and the 09s who had these longer term injuries might actually be back to play, um, with more games. And that, I mean, what it was, Hull, um, yeah, we, Shrewsbury, three games, um, we, Black we Hull Hull. In the end. Yeah. oh, well, and, and obviously, Akron, yeah, last week. which would which would have been um, four tough games, um, but actually. Um, considering that they they're coming back, that is, is there any potential silver line in the, in, in this really? Uh, it, it's a tough one because you can see it on two sides of the coin. You can say that it's given Lee Johnson opportunity to take stock, to to run the rule over everybody, to to pull everything together, um, and maybe you know having that breathing space for for fourteen days or ten days or whatever it was, is it's been no bad thing. The other side of the coin is of course it's four games and. That's a lot of games to catch up, and and at a time when I think you know Hull were not having the best of form, it probably was a good time to play them. Um, I think managers always say, don't they, that they and players rather have played the games and have the points in the bag than than have games in hand, and I think that's very true. I think you know Sunderland have been bitten by that before. You know, we always assumed that oh, we've got these games in hand, but actually it came to pass was it last season, the season before last. That they never got the points returned that everyone expected or hoped that they would get from the games in hand. And, and you, you, you know, even when you look at international breaks, people clamour for the games to be played rather than rescheduled because, again, it can come back and bite you. And I think, you know, I, I, I would rather have played that game against Blackpool earlier in the season, and, and that would have been one game less to worry about now. But, you know, in hindsight, beautiful art, isn't it? But it's, it's, it's difficult. It will be difficult to know whether this break has been a good or a bad thing, I think until three or four weeks time, when we can assess the impact it's having on the, the squad as a whole and the, the 11s that Lee Johnson's been able to, to name. I mean, it's interesting as well, Luke O'Neill coming back with um, Lee Johnson preferring four at the back, whether he sees Luke O'Neill as a right back or whether as he sees him as, as many people want to see him as a midfielder. So there, there are, you know, issues and questions to answer for Lee Johnson like that, I think. Um, he appears to be going 4 3 threes, not averse to playing 4 4 two. I mean, it'll be very interesting to see, you know, over the next few weeks, whether he too tweaks his system, whether he tweaks where he's playing certain players, whether he's able to integrate the likes of Danny Graham and Will Grigg into a squad and get them scoring goals again. These are all questions he's having to mull over and ponder. But, you know, I think it's inevitable with the number of games that they're going to have to play, your Will Griggs, your Danny Grahams will be playing. They will be involved because you can't just leave players to one side just because you think they're low on confidence or they're not going to score goals because they will be needed. I think you know, big um, uh, one player that proves that point is Ada McGeady being left out in the cold by Phil, McC Phil Parkinson. You know, McGeady coming back in has been a big plus. Certainly was a big plus at Lincoln. And Lee Johnson's right. You can't, if you've got players of his ability, you can't sideline them, you can't ostracise them, you can't leave them out because they can be the difference at this level. 
between you know winning games and, and not winning games. And I think for all the criticism that Will Grigg and Danny Graham receive, and quite justifiably, I've got no complaints about the, that criticism. They are nonetheless, though, experienced players at this level. And so I don't think Lee Johnson for one moment would be cutting his nose off and um, keeping them out of the squad or, or keeping them away from the, the front line, if you like. Yeah, I see a lot of pragmatism with Lee Johnson as opposed to, well, the Phil Parkinson was probably a lot more dogmatic where, um, you know, he, he, see, he sees problems and he tries to, to find, really find the, the, the best way to resolve them. And I do think he wants to, mm. to get the most out of everyone. I mean, you mentioned McGeady there and, and I think you're exactly right where, if you've got a, a player who's potentially a problem player, but from the sounds of it, when I listened to the unfiltered podcast that, uh, that uh, Danny and, and Frankie did with them, uh, the, the club's official podcast, McGeady almost said to say as if there wasn't any problem. Now, it'll be very interesting to hear Phil Partington's side of the story, and I'm, and I'm sure he, he, he will um, on, a, on a similar setup on, on a, um, a, a talk show or a podcast somewhere. You know, it'll be interesting to hear his side of the story, but... Um, Regardless of whether you've got a problem player or not, I think the important thing is you've got to be able to, to, to man manage them and get the most out of them. And I think it's a similar scenario with Danny Graham and Will Grigg, where all right, they might not have the same problems as allegedly McGeady had, or that Parkinson saw in McGeady where it was maybe going to harm squad morale, but they, they've maybe got slightly different problems where it is low confidence or maybe not quite fully fit, or they're not quite fitting in a, a certain system. I think you're exactly right where. You've just got to get the most out of them regardless, especially in a season like this when you've got um, we've got even more fixtures and there's even more pressure on us now um, to get some points in the ball. We, we, we can't just accept that players simply aren't part of a squad. We can't we can't just have like a 15-man squad with, with a few extra to, to, to make the numbers up on the bench and in training. Well, and, and also bear in mind the, the transfer window opens now. So, you know, at least Lee Johnson in a position for the next three or four weeks to be able to try and manipulate the squad a bit, manoeuvre things around a bit and um, give himself um, some leverage, if you like, in, in terms of having a push for promotion this season. I mean, it won't be easy, I think, you know, to, to try and um, shift players out. It's going to be a big um, issue. I think, they, they, you know, they will obviously try and uh, move some out. I think that's one of the things that, Lee Johnson will have been uh, eyeing up over the last 10 days, looking very closely at the players he feels are going to be a significant part of his squad. And maybe those players that aren't and whether they can move one or two out to, to bring one or two in. Um, but he's also said, you know, right from the start that he's, you know, it, it, one of the ways of overcoming the, the problems that the salary cap, et cetera, uh, gives clubs in League One and League Two is you 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 make the most of your under 23s you 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 know you make the most of the the, the um, resources that you've got available within the club, which I think is another heartening side to Lee Johnson. He is you know he's he's more than prepared to um, harness the sort of the talent they've got within the club as well as looking outside to try and get players in. So I think it's gonna be an interesting month on so many different levels. A on how the the team and the squad's restructured. <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, how that's restructured. B, how they uh, come back from this COVID outbreak and, 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 and whether it has a longer term effect to the, you know, the squad as a whole because of the issues that you've already raised. Um, and B, whether after this month they can push themselves back, right back into contention again in the top two or three of the, of the, of the division. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and as I say, I think we, we, with the salary cap problems, there's, there's potential that we might have to simply look down to the under 23s, regardless of whether we like it or not. Um, and, if, and if we're looking for a bit more squad depth, um, we genuinely might not have it in the first team to play this sheer number of games where it's literally going to be two games a week from, from now to the end of the season, with the potential exception of one or two weeks here and there. Um, but they could be filled with, with with cup games, you know, um, if if we're if we're progressing that, but I definitely think that going going forward, um, you know, we are going to struggle in, in the transfer window if, if we can't offload players and we we can't really bring any in with with, with the salary cap. Um, but as you say, I say, I think we definitely are going to have to look towards the under twenty threes. I mean, is there any in particular who who you would say he definitely needs to be given, you know, at the very least a, a shot at a couple of games? Well, uh, the. the the, the names you've already mentioned, really, the ones that, that stand out. I think 
when Kimpioka's fit, I think it'll be interesting to see how much he gets involved or whether he's able to step up um, in the same way that Jack Diamond has. I think that's, you know, the one player that has got um, undoubted ability, but can Lee Johnson harness, you know, the sort of maverick side of Benji Kimpioka? Because if he can, he's a potential um, match winner for, for Sunderland because of his, his unknown sort of for opposition, especially now, as we're going into the second half of the season, most clubs won't have had any experience of him at all. And I think that's always, you know, can be key sometimes. You suddenly introduce a player that the opposition knows nothing about and Kim yeah. Pioca is the sort of player that can disrupt. So I think Kim Pioca is, a, 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 you know, going to be an interesting one. Jack Diamond, I think, is proving himself to be um, an invaluable member now of the, of the squad. Um, Dan Neal, I, I'm, I've got no real issues about age. I think, if, you know, you look through... League One, there are plenty of players, 16, 17, 18 years old, playing in League One. Um, I just worry a little bit, watching Dan Neal, I think it was at Fleetwood, in that um, trophy game. I just thought he looked a little bit lost. I think if, he, if Lee Johnson can nail where Dan Neal is going to play, and, and it may be Dan Neal's biggest strength is going to be an impact player off the bench. Um, well, so be it. If that's going to give him experience, if he's going to get 15, 20 minutes at the end of games to... to make an impact, well, that's just as important as players who start games and play 60 minutes. So I think, you know, he is, is going to be another young player that we'll, we'll see a lot more of. You mentioned Ollie Younger. Uh, Morgan Feeney is another one that we didn't see much of, yeah. but what I did see of him, I liked. Forgot about so I think it gives him options at the back. So I think he's, he's certainly got um, players he can call upon and, and can play their part. I, I'm of no fear in that respect, because at least that was one thing about the remodelling of the under 23s is to get players in who could step up into the first team squad rather than there being too big a divide between the academy players and the first team. Yeah, I mean, with Dan Neal, I've, I've often thought that there's a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon of him and he played that one half decent pass through to Will Grigg in, in pre-season that Will Grigg scored from and he's, he's looked quite sharp in a few in the few games he has played. And I feel as I say a lot of people would, would jump on the bandwagon and slightly and and hailing him as like the the, the second coming of, of of Jesus or something. Like almost as if you, you put him in the team and that's sort of going to be all of our problems solved. But um I think if it was a different scenario, I would have maybe said don't put any pressure on him. But I think with the way things are going, we are going to have to play twice a week out of our current centre midfielders, especially if we want to be playing 4-3-3. You can't really expect them to play like most games until the end of the season. I mean, Leppett and now I think he's 34. And although I, I do genuinely think he's been probably our most consistent performer of, so far this season, Max Power, a player who I have criticised quite a lot this season, but seems to be coming into his own a little bit under Lee Johnson. And then, of course, you've got Scowan and Dobson there, who um, I wouldn't quite give him the, the same plot plaudits as other midfielders. We, we just might have to simply look to anyone who can who can do a job there. But you mentioned earlier Luke O'Neill. He, he's, he's definitely a player who I would like to see come into the fold in, in centre midfield because I think we've seen that the best out of him when he's been further forward. I do think he, he did a good job as a wing back um, when he had a bit more freedom to go forward and getting used like differently to to playing as a, in a back four. Um, but I think we've seen his, his best games when he's been playing just off the striker or, or as part of a, a midfield three, depending on the way you want to look at it. Um, so I, I would definitely say Luke will nine, you know, if, when he's back from, from his injury, I'd love to see him push forward. I'm sure he would appreciate that as, as, as well, getting to play in, in what's more of his natural position. Um, speaking of right backs, um, a player who I've been asking a lot of people about, Dion Sanderson, uh, obviously mm -hmm. might have to come in to, to, to cover, but... As much as Conor McLaughlin, I think, has been OK since Lee Johnson came in, I feel as if Dion Sanderson can offer us something maybe that he can't, where he's a bit more comfortable on the ball, a bit quicker and a bit better at going forward. Um, are you at all concerned that with the January window coming up, Wolves might look at the, the amount of games he's had and start putting pressure on us to say, you've, you've got to play him or, or we're going to recall him? Because what's the point of him training him with us if he's not even going to be playing when he could be doing the exact same thing at Wolves? Um, I, I doubt it. I think uh, Wolves are, are, are wise enough to know that, you know, when these players are going out on loan, they're not necessarily going to play every game. I think, you know, circumstances haven't helped Sanderson with the change of manager, but I think now Lee Johnson's 
been quite prepared to involve him. And I think, as you say, with the number of games coming up, um, I think Sanderson will get games. I don't think, you know, as long as, I mean, clearly Bailey Wright um, and Jordan Willis are going to be the two mainstays, but both are actually injury prone. I mean, Jordan Willis has had this problem with his knee <coughs> and Bailey Wright um, historically does tend to pick up a hamstring or, or, or problems in that respect. So I think, you know, and that's inevitable with the number of games that those two, you, you probably will find that they're going to pick up injuries. I think Sanderson, Feeney, uh, Flanagan, they're all going to get games. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be overly concerned about Wolves recalling Dion Sanderson. Um, but it does give, it, it does give Lee Johnson, you know, you know, the, the sort of uh, element of a problem at the back as to what his first choice back four is going to be. Hume coming back to see, uh, you know, is McFadden who's who's the better of the two, Hume or McFadden, um, who who plays at right back. So he's got, um, you know, questions to answer in, in the in the defence. But sometimes you sometimes find that a player goes in and he just hits, it it, ha it works, you know, and, and you solve a problem because one player's misfortune is another player's fortune. And, um, you know, that's the nature of football. But um, at least they've got, at least Lee Johnson's got players that, that can give him problems. It's not as though he's only got one left back. He's only got one right back. You know, he's got a pl plenty of players for those positions and with a lot of experience as well, as well as younger players like 09, who are very versatile um, and, can, and, and can basically play anywhere. So, I, you know, I think that's a positive going forward as well. I mean, you mentioned Josh Goen. I actually like Josh Goen. I think he does a lot of unseen work. I think he's, he's got a real engine on him. I mean, he's now starting to do, you know, what he was brought in to do. And, and that's Rat. I mean, that's his nickname. And I think, you know, the Lincoln game especially, he, he was exceptional um, because he just keeps the ball moving all the time. He doesn't like to dwell on it. He likes to get it forwards. And I think, you know, he's maybe one of the probably more unsung players in the, in the team. But, you know, it, again, he's, you know, he's, he's on three yellow cards now. He's going to pick up a couple more, I'm sure. So at some point, not sure when the amnesty, clear, I think. He, he could be missing. Yeah. 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 Um, I think you feel quite similar to Scowen via Sands versus Mika Dobson when I, and every time I t every time I tell someone this, uh, I look at the screen and, and the other person starts laughing. I think you're the first person who who hasn't, because um, I, I feel as if Dobson is is quite an, an uns I wouldn't say unsung hero, but he is unsung where he offers us something, and I feel as if he offers offers us um, a little bit of energy um, defensively, and he, he he can kind of cut passing lines and and and, and mark plays out the game quite well, and, and I don't think that that gets seen. I just think it's when he's it's when he's on the ball, he um he's he's he gives it away, and, and I think that's when the problems um start to come uh, with 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 um George Dobson. Um, to move on ever so slightly, um, just to 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 kind of wrap things up or almost um prediction for the game. I think it's an interesting one because I think um it, it it could be a real benchmark for Lee Johnson in terms of what he's working with, where he can take this squad. Because I think coming out of the back of the COVID problem, going to a team that likes to lump it forwards, uh, a, a, as we were hearing earlier, has now sort of found form again because they've got key players back in. Um, they'll be on a bit of a high on the back of that. Uh, I think it's going to be a testing game. I think without question, I think most games in League One are, but I think this above all else is probably one of the most testing they'll have had this season because of the COVID outbreak, because of Northampton, the win over Gillingham, getting that. I mean, it's, I don't think there's any coincidence that James mentioned earlier that when you bring the centre-back Sheen back in it and, and they win a game having lost the last four without him. So I think it will be a benchmark for Lee Johnson. If they can go to six fields and get a result, draw or win, I would feel sort of very, very sort of optimistic about moving forwards because I think, you know, this is not an easy game. They might be 19th in the table, but I don't think they're necessarily a 19th place team from what James has been saying. The key, I think, as James pointed out, is the first goal. I think if Sunderland score the first goal, they probably will go on to get something from the game, probably win the game. Um, but uh, I gather the pitch isn't great there. It's not. It's not getting um, a lot of attention because the 
company that was employed to uh, do all the groundworks was, was laid off basically because of the pandemic and they haven't replaced them. And so the pitch has been suffering. Now, whether that's that, you know, it, it's a hindrance because McGeady likes to keep the ball down. They do tend to like to play the, the ball on the floor with Lee Johnson. That might be an issue. But as I say, I think it's a benchmark game. And if Sunderland can get something from it, I will feel very optimistic about the way forwards. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's going to be a lot of problems. I think it's an interesting one. And it is really hard to to give a scoreline prediction like that's so specific because there's just so many different factors. But if you had to, if you had to put a number on it... I, I wouldn't even go there because I'll, I'll go back to the game at Lincoln where nobody, I think, if you'd said to anybody before the game, they're going to go to Lincoln and win 4-0, you'd have been laughed out of the court. I, I, I just don't, it, it, this is another one for me, this Northampton game, it could go 3-0 to Northampton, it could easily go 3-0 to Sunderland, but by the same token, it could just as easily end 0-0. I, it's, it's, I just think it's a really difficult one to call. Um, as I say, I think it all hinges on the first, on if there is a first goal. Yeah, um, I mean, I feel as if one one good way to go with Sunderland recently is if in doubt go one one, and I think that that that's the route I'm going to go down. Where it seems if if you can't predict the game, you go one one, you're going to have a fifty percent chance of, of getting it right. So so I'll say one one if if, if you aren't going to uh, give give us a, a, a prediction. But I suppose you're right when you say like. It could just as easily be three 0 either way. It could be nil nil. Could be one one. Could be two two. Could be four one. You just you, you've got no idea with with all the factors going on. I mean, aside from Northampton, we we don't even know how how we're going to fare really, and how we can expect us to to, to line up really. Exactly, because I, we just don't know what the effect of the last ten days is going to be. Mm-hmm. It, it, it'll be it'll be very telling there to to see you know how fit the players are, who plays. You know, is is someone going to get left out because the they're still struggling. I think it was might be Alan St. Maximin, I think, from your vessel is, is still mm. out um after having the virus. I think Lascelles might have been as well. Could be, could yeah, be the wrong. Two, I think they're the two with long long COVID, aren't they? Yeah, um, which is you know that that's put them out, you know, potentially for the rest of the season. Anyway, Nick, uh thanks a lot for coming on. It's uh, been a been a, a good chat about Sunland. Good, no problem at all. Pleasure. Yeah. And uh hopefully we'll be back on here. Um However, we'll be back on here and we'll be gloating about a 3 0 win. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> as you say, we just can't do that. Uh, thanks to everyone listening as well, uh, and I'll see you later.